Hi, uh, it's Janet Fitch, and it's noon on Wednesday, so that means it's Writing Wednesday, where we talk about all things literary, including uh, and especially answering your questions about your work, about fiction, about uh, the writing life, uh, and writing in general, and especially specifics. So if you have questions this time, uh, please get ready to share them. Uh, but I started with um, uh, some questions that uh, have come to me during the week, and uh, I thought I would uh, address address them. Hope things writing has been going okay for you. I'm uh, working on a new book, and uh, it's been hard. I've been going over. I thought I had a scene that worked very well, uh, and this is one of the problems that you have when you're or one of the issues that every writer faces um, is when a, th a scene is working well emotionally the movement is going well but the uh, there are things in the scene that don't work on a f kind of a real on the realistic level you know that there might be better choices for for um, the external scene you know the things that happen are happening but you've got the emotion well then when you try to change the emotion when you try to uh, fix the scene so that it works better in the external reality um, then uh, your emotional movement uh, falls apart so I've been having one of those uh, weeks and you have to um, no matter how well the scene, the exterior scene works in the new, uh, more realistic or rational uh, sense, if the emotional movement that you wanted and the, the excitement and the movement that you had was working, don't, you know, don't throw out the emotional movement in favor of the realistic scene. You have to find a way to make that emotional movement work um, or you just have a skeleton. You don't have the living, breathing organism that your scene needs to be. So you have to be very careful, uh, and this is something that happens to people in workshop, is they have something that works, that's very strong emotionally, but then people start making suggestions and oh maybe this maybe that oh you know I think hi Linda I think that it would work better if you did this you know and then the poor writer is starts to make those changes and then realizes that it, they've completely ruined their scene it's lifeless um, it may have conformed and, and um, um, used the suggestions that were offered but uh, it it's dead it killed the scene. So uh, I recommend what you do in that kind of situation is you get rid of the changes, you go back to where it was and try again, try again. And, um, you know, the important thing is, is keeping that, the liveliness going. Hey, Jill, is keeping the liveliness and the emotional impact and that being very careful when you're modifying the scene, um, that you keep that lively emotion or bring it back uh, if you've killed it. Um, so, so much of writing is about knowing the emotional impact you want to make with the scene and, um, you know, doing whatever you can to make sure you deliver that and you don't, um, you don't kind of break its back by stepping on it. Hi, Gail. So that's the first, I guess I, I um, you know, that's what I've been doing this week, <clears throat> is putting a scene back together after having ruined it. What are you going to do? That's writing, you know. Um, so I thought I, you know, any questions anybody has, please, uh, please write them and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, the first question uh, that was sent to me was, what was the best piece of writing advice you ever got? Well, 
if you got some good tips, please just put them in the comments. Um, my, the best piece of writing advice I ever got was being asked what was unique about my sentences. Uh, I could tell a story, I could create character, I could do lots of stuff, but my writing wasn't very good. My, the writing itself, the sentences, the word choice, the word order, the variations of tone, the metaphors, you know, all of that, the writing of the writing wasn't very good. And so that was my best piece of writing advice is what's unique about your sentences, that I really had to work on my sentences uh, and make you know, so the reading wasn't just about following the story, that there was actually something there um, on the page that was that would give the reader pleasure while they were getting the story. So anybody got a good tip? Hi, Brenda. Anybody got good tips, um, uh, writing tips for themselves? Um, somebody uh, said that Stephen King, was it Stephen King, I think? Uh, somebody told him, asked him about inspiration, you know, uh, and his best writing tip was, you know, uh, don't wait for inspiration. You, you know, inspiration is great if you're a poet, but if you're a novelist, you need to be able to turn out pages and pages and pages on a, steadily on a regular basis, like every day, um, you know, nobody asks a doctor if they're inspired. You know, they go into work and they deal with what's in front of them. And the writing is the same thing. So Gail says uh, her best writing tip was leave gaps so the reader can fill it. Don't say everything. Yeah, that's really interesting. And that speaks to the need to uh, have some mystery, you know. So if you tell the reader more than they want to know, they're like, they back up, you know, it's like, I didn't want to know that. Whereas you, if you tell them slightly less than they want to know, then they're, they're going to be listening. They're going to be paying attention, moving, le leaning forward. Okay. John, uh, or is this Janet? Probably Janet. Uh, don't edit as you write something that I struggle with. Don't edit as you write. You know, I think this applies to people who will beat a sentence to death. Uh, hi, Yael. Uh, beat a sentence to death and keep going backwards, you know, and the direction needs to be forward. But e editing and writing are, are, they're close together. You know, everybody writes a line quickly and then you might go back and go, you know, does this actually say what I want to say? Is there a bigger breath I can take here? Is there a, a dependent clause that will explain a little bit more here? So the writing is one thing, but you don't want to be constantly going back and reworking chapter one. You know, you do want to be making forward progress. Um, so editing while you're writing is, you know, it's interesting. It's like how you perceive that. Um, I know people who have to make everything perfect as they go along, writer, you know, professional writers. Um, to me, I, I couldn't do that. I write in drafts, so I have to get to the end of the draft before I even know what shape I want things to be in or what needs to be there. Um, but I start the day, be the next day, I'll write something and then I start, hi Peggy, hi Toby, hi Ruthie, start the next day I start the next day by rewriting what I wrote the day before and moving forward, but I don't go back four chapters. You know, I'm working on this chapter and then I'll work on the next chapter and then I'll work on the next chapter and I will not go back to the beginning until I'm done with the draft um, because that would be madness. Um, am I seeing what is there or what to see? Hmm. Suzanne, I'm trying to picture what you're, uh, what you're looking for here. Um, my seeing what is there. Sometimes you, you write and you can't think of anything more. I, I don't have anything more to say about this. 
And then if you look at your sentences and you see very short ones, if you pop them open, you might, there might be more inside the sentence, you know, like you might not realize that, you know, she went to the store, you know, how did she go to the store? Um, what was she doing just before she went to the store? What was on her mind when she went to the store? What happened in the parking lot? Uh, what's the mood? You know, what? where's the conflict? What's the tension? That I, I just had one of those where I had a character who went to the store, uh, went to Trader Joe's because I needed to get her out of the house, get some food. And then, you know, starting to ask, what does it mean to get food in? Um, what what is she hoping to do with that food? What kind of a mood is she planning on trying to build? Or what is she what is she what needs is she going to fulfill with those foods? And then also those little encounters uh, in the Trader Joe parking lot. Uh, she has been presenting herself as a formerly angry person, but we see her in that Trader Joe parking lot, and she says oh no, this is a currently angry person. And then she loses it in the Trader Joe's as well. And it's like, but she also recognizes she's doing it. So I can layer up the complexity of the character using, you know, using a scene that I didn't know what I was going to be doing there. Um, but you always have your little antenna out trying to figure out what you're doing it. Uh, it's so hard to do. I do grammar edits as I go, but other than that, drafts. Yeah, that's what I do. Hi, Larry. Um, so you don't go back until the whole draft of the whole novel is there. Yes, that's what I do, Ruthie. Do I have an outline already worked out? No, I have no idea what I'm doing. So I'll get to the end or near the end. And then I might read the whole thing and go, what the hell? Or start again. And I know things now. But if I started working on it while I was, you know, rewriting or editing while I was working forward, um, I just can't imagine what a mess that would be. Too many drafts, too many conflicting ideas, you know. You have to be work I have to work in kind of a linear way or else you get too many drafts and then it's like am I on draft two am I on draft three you know what what's the picture here so no I don't go back until the draft is done I mean the way I work right at Oleander is every scene I could see clearly I wrote that scene I threw it in a box and then I wrote another scene I could see and threw it in a box and when the box was full I took them out did three hole punch put them in a three ring binder and found some sort of order. Uh, then I could see what didn't fit and what still needed to be written. So I didn't even have a real draft. I just had a lot of scenes that then I had to pull a draft together uh, out of. Um, am I seeing what is there or what I want to see? Suzanne said, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's writing, you know, did I say what I want to say? Especially if you're trying to be subtle. You know, is the reader getting it? Or do I get it because I know what I'm planning? Does it, and this is where having uh, other readers uh, is invaluable. The writer's group or even a trusted reader who might not be a writer but is uh, very literary, has a good sensibility. Um, uh, the first time... Hi, September. The first time I've joined one of these. Very cool. All right. Yes, ask questions about writing. That's what I'm here for. Uh, she likes the poetry of the sentences. And let's see if I can get the rest of that comment and the metaphors. Yeah, that's, you know, the, the poetry is reading poetry out loud and then reading your own work out loud and li listening for the rhythms. Uh, building more rhythm, uh, using poetic techniques like uh, alliteration and assonance, the re repetition of vowel sounds and uh, consonant sounds, um, where you take a breath. You know, if you were going to perform the piece, would you feel like you want to perform it? Is it, is it beautiful? Uh, and then metaphors are asking, you know, you avoid the cliche, you know, what 99 out of 100 people would say. And you get really specific, you know, big as a house. Well, 
how big how big like what are the what's the situation we're in what is the vocabulary of the um what's the vocabulary of the protagonist the consciousness um what kind of a metaphor would a plumber have about a bad relationship or a baker about a bad relationship? Don't just use big as a house. Anything that anybody could say is something that nobody should say. So we're not ever looking for one size fits all. We're looking for language that fits that character, that protagonist. Why would they use that, you know, metaphor? And then ask yourself, what is it? What is it really? Like I had a, this is a metaphor I, made up I got yesterday uh, somebody was um, was high my character uh, uh, said so and so was high how high was he you know always ask yourself that how high how big was it how high was it you know why it was so you know it's like that's the way jokes come uh, comedians write their jokes how high was it how uh, and somebody was high as a crow on a telephone pole you know, I was just looking around, what's high, um, what's cold, what's hot, and do something that's never been done before. Uh, that's the work of writing. Uh, and then the poetic, the poetry in the sentences is about reading poetry out loud. I, I read, um, my favorite poets are, are really strong in the ear, you know, Dylan Thomas and Sexton, uh, T.S. Eliot, and I read them out loud and then I read a piece that I'm writing and I can hear, oh, I need another syllable there. Or, you know, it feels like, like oatmeal in my mouth. It does, there are no corners. There are no, the consonants aren't, aren't tasty, you know. So reading out loud is a really good way of, of getting more poetry into it. Um, uh, and Larry's talking about uh, never thought of layering. Um, how much description do you think is acceptable? It all depends on the scene um, and what's going on. You know, um, you're not going to stop in the middle of the sword fight and notice the, the slant of the light and the down on your opponent's cheek. You know, uh, you're going to be noticing, you know, the way the hands and, you know, the way things are, you know, uh, there'll be sharp verb, you know, uh, work on verbs. So description is based on the speed of the scene, the introspection of the scene, how urgent is what's going on. But remember that a good description could just be a phrase that puts you right there, even in a sword fight, you know, the how it feels to be cut or noticing something specific about your opponent's eyes. Um, just a flash. Uh, whereas a more languorous description needs a more languorous mood. So that's going to, that's going to change. How much description is acceptable? Um, I think of the writer as a fisherman. And when you got a fish on the line, you know, you, you have to figure out, you don't want to lose the fish. That's your reader. So, you know, if you have a big suspenseful question, like Dostoevsky, you know, um, if you want to know which of the brothers murdered the, the, the father, you're going to allow him to, you know, to divert and uh, describe and uh, uh, because you want to know who killed the father. So he's got you on the line pretty solidly. Um, so you always think about that is how much do they want to know uh, what's going to happen. Um, made the mistake of trying to edit before the story is written. Yeah, that's you just make it a mess before you have anything to sculpt you need it to be hard a little hardened before you can sculpt it so yeah hi roberta let's see september wants to uh let's see we have um wendy um talked about third person omniscient and that's where that's the god point of view where you move from character to character you dip into her mind his mind you come out into that one out and uh, there are ways to know whose mind you're in because they have their own opinions and stuff so omniscient can sample everybody's and it also can have a voice of its own the narrator can have a voice of its own um so how do, 
How do you know when to pull out wide and when to push in? That is, that's the, that's the job is you develop your own sensibility. You know, you dip into that person's head for a reason. You get what you wanted out of that person and you come out again and then you move to somebody else or you can stay in the narrator for a while, move to somebody else. Um, narrator knows things that the character doesn't, uh, but the character can reveal things that, um, the, that the author wants to know what's going on inside that person. Uh, Suzanne, uh, oh, that's right, hi. Um, so anyway, those are some, some ideas. Um, I had a question uh, from the internet this week which was, how do I write a strong, compelling, and enticing first page to my novel? So this is sort of the opposite of writing the whole thing and getting a draft and then going back. Um, the, um, and what I'm a big proponent of, um, there's deductive and inductive reasoning and I, I'm a big proponent of looking at looking at things and then making a rule from the thing you're reading, the different things you're reading, looking, pulling it apart. How do they do what they do? And then make some judgments or observations rather than having a rule and then looking for examples to show the rule. So. How do you make a good opening to a novel? Uh, what I would do is look at openings to novels and then make a statement uh, describing, describe what they're doing, what made it good. Uh, and then you can have a bunch of rules that are based on actual observation. Uh, so I'm a big, th big believer in kind of dissembling your own textbook. Uh, when I remember when I taught kids uh, formal poetry, uh, middle schoolers, I didn't put a poem down and say, this is a sonnet, you know, this is a villanelle, this is a ballad. What I did was we, I put a poem in front of them, hi Zunaid, uh, put a poem in front of them and had them count the beats how many beats in a line and then the next line so four three four three what was the rhyme scheme oh well that's a ballad that's ballad form and people use it to tell a story they can be very long they used to be you know kind of like a popular storytelling device these these um you know pretty boy floyd and outlaw oklahoma knew his name he was in the town of shawnee you know so we'd study these uh different forms so i would put them give them three poems by edison vincent malay uh, because shakespearean sonnets are like it would put them off ninth graders but we went through and we counted the lines we looked at the rhyme scheme. We, is there anything else you notice about that? You know, this has a weird rhyme scheme and then two couplet at the end. Oh, six, eight, couplet. Or is it eight, six, a couplet? Um, see, I did it, did it that way. So once they had the scheme worked out, or the Villanelle, once they had the, sch the scheme worked out, then I could say, okay, and that's a sonnet. That's a villainable opening. So get on. So if you have, can you cut your bandwidth? Can you go off your? Oh yeah, no, I'll just. I'll there just we go. It. We're back. Hi. <laughs> My husband was watching a video. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, the video was using too much bandwidth. Sorry about that. So we're talking about. The experimental version of fi figuring out how to begin something. I'm so sorry about the, uh, the use up of the bandwidth. Why do my posts originally marked as spam? I don't know. 
weird. So anyway, we're talking about what makes a good novel opener. Um, and so instead, just like figuring out how to, what is a villanelle or a gazal or something, it's much better to look at the form and then figure it out, make your conclusions. So what I did is I brought out some recent novels and we're going to, hi, yes, I'm back. I, I brought some uh, recent novels and then I thought we'd look at the first page and see how they started them. All right. Well, this is a book I love. It's out right now called You Again. Really enjoyed it. Anybody who's looked at my Facebook page knows that I, I was crazy about that. Let's see how she started this. Okay. Well, it starts, it's a diary entry of some sort. So she's doing some interesting stuff. One, 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 one. I'm going to flip this. Uh, you don't have to look at me. That's boring. All right. Let's see what she does. All right. So she has some kind of an interesting entry. That can't be a month, day, or year. This is a, you know, diary entry. I saw myself last night. Well, that, that's what the book is about right there. I drove right by myself. Well, it grabs you. It's like, how did that work? In a taxi through a winter rain, coming home very late from work on a shadowed block southwest of the Holland Tunnel. I gazed out the cab windows, worn down from the day. See, we get who the person is, worn down from my day. We get where they are, a little bit of, a little bit of detail, the Holland Tunnel. A shallowed block southwest of the Holland Tunnel. Um, I gazed out the cab window, worn down from my day, and then suddenly she appeared, emerging from a dark doorway in silver platform sandals and a pink velvet coat. So very specific. Me, the way I used to be. And then there's an interaction with the woman. She wants to stop the cell, the, the cab. She wants to, to somehow talk to that girl. And all the impedimentia of a middle-aged person, the ibuprofen gel caps and the putty of crushed energy bar, the putty. You know, we're talking about poetic language. You know, she, I'm sure, was talking about like a smushed power bar. But she stayed with, she stayed with it until she came up with some original language. Remember, we're talking, I was saying the best advice I ever got was what's unique about your sentences. My old writing teacher, Kate Braverman, used to say, um, Every good sentence has one good word, and that putty is the good word, and she worked for it. Uh, so um, I gathered my strength, and I leapt out in the rain, um, and the girl disappears. That's the first chapter. I mean, the, that's the first... That's the first page of that novel. So it draws me in. I know immediately what is happening. This woman has written thrillers. She's an Edgar Award winner. Uh, and it's just out. It's a brand new book. Um, so I saw myself in the rain. She leaps out to try to meet that girl. It starts out like a thriller. You're immediately in it. We have weather. It's raining. Raining is already always good. Um, we've got a bunch of crap that we're looking through our purse, um, getting good language in there so the reader trusts that the writer is going to do some interesting things on the literary level. Um, and the there's a payphone, and we live in a world where there aren't payphones. So already there's several weird things that are happening right on the front page. So you're right into the book. You are... Um, given um, a form, which is this 1111 somehow, and diary form. So we know what the form is. And um, the, the urgency that she wants to see this person. So that's, the, that's a good opening. You again. Uh, here's Ocean Vuong, uh, uh, an award-winning book on Earth, We Are Briefly Gorgeous. How does he open this? Well, he's a poet, so he's going to make some really interesting language moves. 
And his first page says, let me begin again. I mean, it trips you up, you know, and ever anybody, 99 out of 100 people might say, let me begin. But by saying, let me begin again, it already is made strange. It's already got our attention. And this is Dear Ma, so letter to mother. I am writing to reach you, even if each word I put down is one word further from where you are. Now there's a poet. That's a poet opening. The language here. Even if I put, even if each word I put down is one word further from where you are, I'm writing to meet you, to reach you. So what do we mean by reach and what do we mean by these words? He's already tuning us in. You know, look again, think a little harder. I am writing to go back to the time at the rest stop in Virginia when you stared horror struck at the taxidermy buck hanging over the soda machine by the restrooms, its antlers shadowing your face. In the car, you kept shaking your head. I don't understand why they would do that. Can't they see it's a corpse? A corpse should go away, not get stuck forever like that. So death is already in it. Violence is already in it. A weird, you know, this weird bluntness about death. Um, I think now of that buck, how you stared into its black glass eyes and saw your reflection, your whole body warped in that lifeless mirror. So it makes us ask the question, what is going to be warped? What is going to be a lifeless mirror? It's tuning your reader in to your concerns. How perhaps it was not the grotesque mourning of a decapitated animal that shook you, but the taxidermy embodied a death that won't finish, a death that dies perpetually as we walk past it to relieve ourselves. Okay, so he, what he is doing is he is subtly laying out the themes of the book, and we talked about themes last, last time. It takes a people. It takes us a while to figure out our themes. I'm sure that this was not the first thing he wrote, although he might have. He's a poet. He knows what his concerns are. But he's telling us what the theme is, that things that won't die, the past that won't die, is the underlying theme of the whole book. So that's how he opened. So very poetic, a strong image, Those that dead animal and the antlers, an interesting form, the diary, or the this one's a letter to the mother. So we, we're gonna we understand what the voice is. We understand um, the shock that there are gonna be shocks in there, like the shock of the mother seeing the dead animal, uh, the taxidermied animal. He sets he's setting us up. And um, uh, we get kind of the elevation of language that our narrator is going to be capable of the decapitated animal. Um, uh, and so we get a poetic diction that is not conventional. If each word I put down is one word further from where you are, we get an elevation of language, a death that dies perpetually, the decapitated animal. We know that there can be a high diction here and the theme, the death that dies perpetually. So this is going to be a serious book with some shocking stuff in it, is what that first page tells me. All right, here's another one. This is a book I really, really loved. Uh, a Prayer for Travelers by Ruchika Tamar. Um, Uh, no, he's not saying he's responsible for the animal dying. He's saying that there's something about death and life that he's going to be talking about. Um, Prayer for Travelers. This was a very interestingly told book because they took the opening page is, is chapter 31. I mean, this is the opening page. So I thought that was really, really an interesting move. And he, she, so she's mixing the chronology 
of the book and you're coming in in the center and somewhere there's going to be a one and a two because here's 31 the next one is three okay. so and three here's five so we go from 31 to five to three or three to five and so you're always going to be watching to see which is your going to be your next uh, your next chapter, and uh, there it's chronological. So chapter three fits in a certain place in the story. So to show us the broken chronology, she actually starts with chapter thirty one. So here here is her opening. Um, Cortazar and Rayuela did that too. Oh, cool. Uh, so here's chapter 31, which is the first chapter. I drove to the crossroads with the windows rolled down, the radio off, scanning the flat, packed earth in the glare of afternoon light, the land broken up by clumps of creosote and rabbit bush. Okay, so that is a good long sentence with a lot of... Uh, a lot of um, uh, dependent clauses tells me that somebody is um, is going to be well detailed. Uh, I'm seeing it very clearly. I love the crossroads because usually the crossroads is like uh, I went to the crossroads, you know, in blues. The crossroads, the place you meet the devil, right? So to open with the crossroads sets up a certain expectation, um, unconscious for the most part. Um, and I'm scanning the flat packed earth in the glare of afternoon light it has a wonderful poetry uh, in the language. Uh, clumps of creosote and rabbit bush. There's, there are corners in the mouth. Uh, so it's a poetic, it's a poetic kind of language. Um, I was hoping to see Penny. So we have I and Penny. I'm looking for Penny. Walk in the shoulder of the road, heading my direction. I drove so slowly it would be impossible to miss her. So we're looking for Penny. We've started by looking for Penny. When I saw her figure, tall and milk tea pale. I love the milk tea. That's very poetic. Uh, her long black hair nearly to her hips. I would pull over and unlock the passenger door. I would make room for her on the bench seat. So now we're seeing the truck, or the bench seat, or an old car that has a bench seat. Um, uh, while she chronicled the saga of the delayed bus, the careless excuse Flocka had given when she hadn't shown up to give Penny a ride. So we're looking for Penny. We're thinking about what Penny's going to say when we find her, but we still haven't found her. So there's an uneasiness that's already set up. When she was finished, we would wait in silence for the reality of the previous day to dawn. She would reach across the seat, and we would embrace each other gently, needing to feel the other whole. She would tuck her chin into the dip of my shoulder, careful to avoid the bruises covering the right side of my face. So somebody got beat up or in an accident. Uh, so we have missing person. We have creosote and rabbit bush, so we're in the southwest. We have the afternoon sun, we have the dust, we have a missing person, and we have somebody has been beaten up in some, for some way. Instead, a, a car horn sounded and a battered tan, Trans Am shot out from behind, flying past, taillights flashing red at the corner of half a mile down the road. So we're getting bing, sudden, sudden appearance of this battered car. Uh, sports car. I watched the car turn off and disappear. For the rest of the drive, I considered what I would say to Penny when she finally answered her door, the nature of a rebu rebuke to deliver. So we're getting, I'm getting a sense of being out in the desert of these wide open desolate spaces, somebody missing, something gritty, somebody got beat up. So she's already bringing us into the world of her book. And that's always a good opening. I, I like a landscape opening. Not everybody uh, likes to resort to that, but I like, I, I, I'm a great believer in place. So I'm very attracted to that. Um, here is um, Disappearing Earth. Oh, let's do this one. The Secrets We Kept. This was a spy novel. 
uh, kind of madmen, CIA in the 50s, and the um, uh, the publication of uh, of Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago, Smuggling It Out of Russia. So it's got an East and a West. Um, and it's from, the we is really interesting. So let's start, see how it starts, The Secrets We Kept. The Typus Prologue. Now this is second person plural. We talked about that. What do you do, second person plural? Okay, we typed, okay, prologue, the typist. So the typist, we typed 100 words per minute and never missed a syllable. Our identical desks were each equipped with a mint shelled royal quiet deluxe typewriter. So already we are in the period. It's got to establish the period. So our identical desks were equipped with a mint shelled, not green, mint shelled, Royal Quiet Deluxe Typewriter, a black Western Electric rotary phone, and a stack of yellow steno pads. So we're now suddenly we're in an office in the 50s, um, up to date for its time. And uh, so immediately, period. Our fingers flew across the keys. Our clacking was constant, bringing in the senses, putting us there, right? We get the scent, we get the, the sound, and then our clacking was constant. We'd pause only to answer the phone or take a drag of a cigarette. So now we have smell and taste. Drag of a cigarette. And this is the intimate level of landscape that we've talked about before. Some of us managed to master both without missing a beat. The men would arrive around 10. One by one, they'd pull us into their offices. We'd sit in small chairs, pushed into the corners while they'd sit in the large mahogany desks or pace the carpet while speaking to the ceiling. We'd listen. We'd record. We were their audience of one for their memos, reports, write-ups, lunch orders. Sometimes they'd forget we were there and we'd learn much more. Who was trying to box out whom? Who was making a power play? Who was having an affair? Who was in and who was out? Sometimes they'd refer to us not by name but by hair color or body type, blondie, red, tits, we had our secret names for them, too. Grabber, coffee breath, teeth. They would call us girls, but we were not. We came to the agency by way of Radcliffe, Vassar, Smith. Okay, so the we here is dealing... Hey, Christy. Hi, Amy. The, the we here deals with uh, almost a... Um, it's almost a Greek chorus, and the typing pool becomes a almost a person in this book uh, as they make their judgments about the events that are happening. Here we don't know. Notice what she doesn't say. She doesn't say it's the CIA. She doesn't say, you know, what they actually do. Um, it puts you into the bodies of the women who are serve the machine and they work with machines and they work with men. Um, so we're entering a very gendered um, environment. We know it's the 50s, and we're going to be locked into these, these women who are not individuals, who are red and tits and uh, blondie. Um, so that's how this book works, began, is it brings you into the period and the gendered office. Uh, that's what she decides to set up first, uh, the secrets we kept. Here's another one, Disappearing Earth. I love this book. Uh, uh, this was set in Ch Kamchatka, um, and it is, uh, let's see, Elvira says, uh, leaves me full of inspiration. Can't wait to uh, begin my new opening dialogue. I, I, I'm somebody, we had this question before, how do you, do you like stories that open with dialogue? And I tend to say, set us up first, get us in there before people start talking, because we don't know who's talking. So we tend not to care so much, you know? I mean, in a thriller, you start right like that, but uh, these are gonna be literary novels. So this starts like this. So Sophia sandals off with standing at the water's edge. It starts August. So these all place, uh, many of them place you in the season. Uh, diary, 
ab absolute day of. Sophia, sandals off, was standing at the water's edge. The bay snuck, I don't like snuck, sorry, um, sneaked up to swallow her toes, gray salt water over bright skin. Don't go out any further, Alyona said. So at least we have a little bit before the first scrap of dialogue. Uh, the water receded. Alyona could see under her sister's feet, so we know there's, it's a sister story, the pebbles breaking the curves of Sophia's ankles, the sweep of grit, sweep of grit, the sweep of grit. Now there's some nice little bit of writing. Not just the grit left by little ways, but the sweep of grit. So it opens it up a little. Sophia bent to roll up her pants leg and her ponytail flipped over the top of her head. Her calves showed flaking streaks of blood from scratch mosquito bites. So they are girls and they are real girls that actually scratch their bites. Alyona knew from the firm line of her sister's spine that Sophia was refusing to listen. You better not. Sophia stood to face the water. It was calm, barely touched by ripples that made the bait look like a sheet of hammered tin. That's nice. The current got stronger as it pulled into the Pacific, leaving Russia behind. Oh, we're in Russia. Okay. Um, leaving Russia behind for open ocean, but here it was domesticated. I like the, you know, that took a little work, finding the domesticated as opposed to uh, it was calm. Uh, here it was domesticated. It belonged to them. Hands propped on narrow hips, Sophia surveyed it the width of the bay, the mountains on the horizon, the white lights of the military installation on the opposite shore. So she's giving us really good landscape picture where we are. The gravel under the sisters was a maze of chips from bigger stones. Alyona leaned against a block the size of a hiking backpack and a meter behind her, so we know we're in Russia, it's a meter, it's not a foot or three feet. A meter behind her was the crumbling cliff face of St. Nicholas Hill, water on one side, rock wall on the other, and they'd walked along the coast all afternoon until they found this patch free of bottles or feathers to settle. When seagulls landed nearby, Alyona chased them away with a wave of her arms. So you get a sense of distance. They've walked all afternoon. There's nobody nearby. There's no bottles. There's this mountain and this sweep of the Pacific, and it's Russia, and we're going, oh my God, you know, and they're very alone, and what we have no idea what's going to happen, but we know that Sophia is not listening to the other sister. Uh, you better not. So some, we're worried about these girls. And it's a, it's set in the Kamchatka Peninsula, uh, which is like the farthest Pacific uh, reach of Russia. Uh, and something is going to happen to these sisters. It's going to happen to other people in the book. Um, and August, it's going to be month to month. Uh, so she's setting out to bring you into this landscape and the tension of the two sisters. Does a pretty darn good job. This is a story set in Trinidad, uh, Golden Child by Claire Adam. Um, and how does this one start? Part one. One. Only Trixie is at the gate when he pulls up. She is sitting on her haunches. Okay, so this is a person. Uh, staring at something across the road. Her four legs. Okay, not, not a person. Planted in front of her. Stolid as tree stumps. Probably an iguana, Clyde thinks. Okay, so first of all, now we are in a place where there are iguanas. He, she doesn't say, we are in Trinidad and in the outskirts and the, near the jungle, blah, blah, blah. No, it's just she. there's a dog looking out across the road. And Clyde says uh, it's probably an iguana. So already we know we're not in Kansas. Or an agouti. Okay, so we're really not in Kansas. Uh, judging by the look on her face. He glances in their direction. So he yanks the handbrake up but can't see what she might be looking at. There's only bush over there on that side of the road. Bush all the way down to the river. And then more bush until you get to the cocoa plantations. So bush in the sense of uh, jungle or pretty wild stuff and then a cocoa plantation. So who, wherever we are, we're somewhere interesting and there's something that dog is looking at that this guy Clyde wants to know. 
What the heck? The leaves are shiny with the little rain that just fell. The asphalt road steaming. We can smell that. We, it gives us the wetness of the environment. Um, he walks down the gate, pulls off his T-shirt, wipes the sweat from his face. The back of his neck is hot and steaming. Uh, he had a little had a little wash before he left for work, but the smell of industrial estate still clings to him. So he knows we know he's an industrial worker. It, it's in his his hair, his clothes, the creases of his pants, oil smell people call it, or petrochemical smell if they're better informed. Today, Clyde knows he smells of grease, ammonia, and rotten eggs because he spent the afternoon going around the plant with the engineer, sealing off valves, hauling open chambers, collecting scents. So he's a working guy. And he works in some kind of industrial oil uh, estate. Opening and closing chambers and valves. A working man. Usually he would have been wearing blue coveralls instead of his own clothes and would have showered at the plant before he left. But since the break-in a few weeks ago, oh, so he's not only has there been a bit break-in, but he's worried about the break-in. And he didn't even stop to shower at the place. He was worried. So there's this dog staring out into the bush. And um, he's since the break-in a few weeks ago, he switched to day work as a temporary measure. So he's worried about a break-in. That's all we know. But we know it's hot. It's tropical. It's There are iguanas and agoutis. And Clyde is worried about a break-in. That sets it up. It's a pretty good book. Um, here's the one I just finished, which I adored, called The Dictionary of Animal Languages by Heidi Sopinka. And this was a very poetic, very fragmented. This is a book that with, withholds a lot. So uh, it's inter it'll be interesting to see the first page and see how she sets up this novel. Pigeon, Columba Livia Domestica, eating bread left by homeless man plus raw field recording of rain. So we know it's a dictionary of animal languages. So pigeon is the first one, is the first animal. That makes us curious. Like what kind of a chapter is she gonna write about a pigeon or pigeons? So the beginning says, my eyes became her eyes, the eyes of someone who died young, which makes them harder to live with. But skeet, so immediately it's like, who's the her and who's the I? It already were curious, already were interested. But skeet doesn't know this, or Undine, or Valentina even. So there are these other people. We don't even know who I is, and, so, and there are these other people now. The only one left who knows is me. Any eggs in this coop frame? Yes, I tell him. So I am frame. That's how we introduce her. Um, but he hasn't heard. He's shaken out the coffee beans and ground out my voice. He's shaking out the coffee beans and ground my voice. So we know that she has survived something. I'm the only one who knows this. The only one left who knows it is me. Any eggs in the coop frame? Yes, I tell him, but he hasn't heard. He's ground out my voice. That's just really good writing. The fork tines clink rhythmically against the steel bowl like the metallic call of a long-legged grassland bird I have transcribed. So she studies birds. The beauty of that sentence, the fork tines click, clink rhythmically against the steel bowl like the metallic call of a long-legged grassland bird I have transcribed. So it's not just somebody, I've, the bird I've heard, it's the bird I have transcribed. So she's some kind of a, you know, we figure maybe a scientist or something studying birds. Her metaphor for the tink of the steel bowl is a bird metaphor because that's what she does professionally. A good move. I am attuned to sounds, and indeed the book has got the best sense work on sound that I've read in a long time. After all the animals I have recorded, 
read glyphic and elemental like songs. Read glyphic and elemental. Glyphic. That's a beautiful word. Oh my God, to describe something. He turns on the tap at the sink. He knows water works better than milk. For what? For the coffee. Um, it occurs to me we are a man and a woman. A woman and a man in a stone house. So I know that frame is a woman. Uh, the man making breakfast. It would have been one of those tender moments that occur, the kind between sex and fully dressed protocol, which the use of protocol is kind of clinical and interesting at that point. But this isn't that. I haven't told him of the letter. Okay, so there's already a mystery. I haven't told him about the letter. It's a bit of a trick. So we have no, this is one of those books, the opening makes you lean in. It's like, what the heck is this about? And it's that kind of a book. You're going to lean in for the whole thing, picking up clues. This is not a, it's not going to be served up on a platter. Uh, it's giving you beautiful clues, but you are the one who has to pull it together. Um, then there's this book, which I adored, um, The Travelers by Let's see if I can get it to turn around. No, nope. yes. Oh, the Travelers by Regina Porter, which is the story of two families, one black, one white, that are intertwined through the generations. Um, this begins with a cast of characters, so it tells me, you know, there's going to be some needing to keep up with who people are. Um, but the very beginning of it is, a, a, in many ways, like that Prayer for Travelers, the one that started with Chapter 31. This is the beginning of this one. There's a picture with barrels, and then pass it on, and then a bunch of dates. So already I'm curious, you know, what the heck is that about? Is it going to start in 1946? I wouldn't be surprised. But then all of these other dates, you know, what's that going to be about? And this begins like this. So it's discrete paragraphs. And it begins, when the boy was four, he asked his father why people needed to sleep. And then you see it's when, 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 when the boy at 14. So this one sets up kind of a, it's kind of a, a mystery in the poetry, in the way there's a repetition, the way these chapters present things. So, when the boy was four, he asked his father why people needed to sleep. His father said so God could unfuck all the things people fuck up. Okay, good dad. Uh, wow. Okay, that's how most people talk to a four-year-old and what they would say to them. So already we know this father is unusual and the son will probably be unusual as well because this is the education he's getting. When the boy was 12, he asked the mother why his father had left. The mother said so he could fuck anything that moves. Okay, so this boy is gonna have really interesting examples of fatherhood. When the boy was 13, he wanted to know why his father was back in their house again. His mother told him, at 41, I can't be bothered to go out and find anyone to fuck. Whoa. So this is the, this is the, this is the, how that man was formed. We're getting it right on the front page. At 14, when profanity seemed to f roll off his friend's tongues like water down a leaky pipe, the word fuck held no allure for the boy. Not after having been through that. None whatsoever. At 18, the boy, Jimmy Vincent Jr., left his hometown of Huntington, Long Island to attend the University of Michigan. And so the beginning will be about that boy. I am just fascinated already by this inventive way of beginning, by the way this short bursts of language have already told us 
some really serious stuff about this boy. And then when we see him go on, we know where he started. So this was like flashes of who that person is. So you see that if I could give you a, you know, rules about how you open a novel, it wouldn't be as interesting as seeing how interesting novels have been begun and then writing your, your rules of ways that you can do it. You know, these moves that people have made are just so interesting. Here's a new one. Here's another one I read recently. This is uh, The Land of Love and Drowning by Tiffany Yannick. And this one is set in um, the, uh, uh, at one time, the Dutch um, Virgin Islands, which became the, the American version. And hers begins this way, okay? So we don't know anything about this book. We just think, oh, chapter one, okay, cool. Owen Arthur Bradshaw watched as the little girl was tied up with lace and silk. He jostled the warm rum in his glass and listened to the wind. Okay, they're tying some kid up. All right, the storm outside. So now we have land, we're getting the storm, environmental weather, you know, I love weather. Starts with a storm. Yay, I'll go for that. Wasn't a hurricane, just a tropical gale. It was the season for storms. So this is about a place, and people know it's just the season. Lightning slated through the heavy wooden shutters that were closed but unfastened. So that's a local person telling you how seriously the people in the story are considering this storm. They've closed the shutters, but they haven't fastened them. They don't think it's gonna be that bad. So it's already telling us something about the environment in a way that shows that your character knows its weather, knows about, you know, they hear a sound that you can't see the source of, but you know, oh, that's from the slaughter yards. Um, it shows that that person is from there that they know what they're talking about. Um, the thunder was coming through the walls built with blue bitch stone. So that's an unusual stone. I've never heard of blue bitch stone. So again, very specific on place. Um, there was no one outside walking in the rain. That sort of thing was avoided. So we're learning a little about the society. You don't walk outside in the rain. A scientist visiting from America had brought the lace and the silk. They were all at the house of Dr. Lovernkrant, an eminent Dutch businessman. Denmark was giving up on the West Indies. And see, instead of a big sample of high school yearbook, you know, of high school textbook of, you know, well, Johnny, in such and such a year, Denmark left the Virgin Islands to America. Uh, no. It, it was part of the story. Denmark was giving up on the West Indies and America was buying it. But Mr. Lovercraft was not leaving. The scientist was tying the girl up. Well, there's something that's kind of creepy, a scientist tying some girl up in a storm. Ugh. He was demonstrating an experiment that had become stale on the continent. So it's like a sh science for show, right? an experiment of electricity. We also know that we're sort of in the backwoods that we're showing this to the yokels because the people on the continent have gotten bored with it. Uh, the little girl was very beautiful and she was very little and she was very afraid. She was also very brave. So nobody seems to be caring about this girl. Captain Bradshaw thought of his, uh, of his, on his daughter, Iona, who was not unlike this American girl, only Iona was more beautiful and at least as brave. So he is identifying this girl as being tied up with his own daughter. So it makes him closer to us. He's probably more in sympathy with this girl, but it all seems very weird. And we're gonna read on, it's like, we wanna know what time period is this? When are we, where are we, what is going on? You know, science is creepy, you know. Um, you know, we always think of science being um, 
rational with his feet on the ground. But when they're using it as a sideshow, it's very interesting because there's a lot of mythology and local lore in this. And this is like putting the way Western science is sometimes had been used like a sideshow. So it kind of confuses itself with otherworldly things. And this captain is kind of an interesting guy. We don't know anything about him yet. Um, so anyway, that's how that opens. So that, I urge you, if you're going to look at, at how to open your novel, you, um, it, it's a really good thing to, um, to take a look at how, just pull down eight, ten novels and ask yourself how you, um, how that person has begun the novel and jot down some notes and then see if you're seeing a picture arising, if there's different types of opening. There's these ones with an interesting broken, or interesting use of the, of the period, like the, the dates at the top or the chapter, you know, the way that chronology is broken or using the letter or the diary, um, uh, the different kinds of tone that are being used. Is this first person, third person? How is it narrated? How much dialogue? Where's the dialogue? How do I feel about the speed of the opening? Um, you're just going to learn a tremendous amount. And uh, there are, you'll learn there, are, there is no rule. There are many approaches and it's really good to have uh, to assemble a number of approaches. So anyway, that is a good big chunk of stuff to think about. And uh, I hope your day goes well. I hope your writing's going well. And we'll see you next week for Writing Wednesday.